Hi everyone, this is Ajay here. Thank you for joining the webinar. We'll just give this a couple more minutes so that more people can join and then we'll get started. Hi Elza and Umpa, you're able to see my screen, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, I think we'll get started. Thank you everyone for joining the Ego Partner Training. So this is a three-day training of which today is the first day and hope everyone is doing well and safe at home given the number of cases which are rising. I hope that there are no specific issues that you are seeing right now. So I'll just go over the structure of the training. So throughout the entire three-day training, we'll be taking you through the digit implementation, which is the session that you've joined today. Post that, we'll be talking about the platform overview then we have a session on DevOps, which is again, uh, structured for today. We have a couple of product demos lined up for tomorrow. Post that mostly it's session catered towards engineering folks where they can learn to configure and customize Digit as well as look at an extension case study where another partner has been able to extend Digit to use it for new use cases. I'll just put down the ground rules of the training today. So the chat, uh, for all the participants has been disabled because of the number of participants. So at any point, if you have any questions, you can directly put it in the Q&A box, which you can see as part of the Zoom invite. Uh, other than that, we'll take the questions as they come. So this is the structure of the training. Talking specifically about today's session, we're going to be talking about the digit implementation overview where I'll walk you through the eGov and digit overview. So I'm Ajay Rathod and I manage the partnerships here at eGov. Post that the next 20 minutes will be program governance, which will be taken by Umkar, who looks after the delivery of the projects here. Then people prerequisites, the kind of skill sets that you will need to implement Digit is something Elzan will cover. Then she's going to also take you through the infra prerequisites. So this is the agenda of the session today. So this will give you a good overview of how a Digit implementation works and the kind of skill set that you would need to uh, sort of implement digit, any specific module. So before we jump right into an overview of ego and digit, I first want to take a poll. So all of you brace yourself. First thing I really wanted to know is how familiar you are with digit and what's your expectation from this session today and also the trainings in general? I hope you're able to see the poll on the screen. I'll give you 30 odd seconds to answer this. I see 50% of the people have voted. The rest of you, please let us know. This will be helpful for us to understand what's the expectation for the training and how familiar you are with the digit. Based on that, I will be going through the content on ego and digit. Giving this 10 more seconds, I think we have around 80% votes already in. Five more seconds closing this. Perfect, I'll take the final count. I'll just share the results. So basically, most of the people have either heard of Digit or had an overview of, from the eGov team. I think it will mostly be me to whom you've gotten a first look at what eGov does and what Digit is. And this is the first training for you. Uh, mostly, you want to look at how Digit implementation work. Perfect. This session is directly going to be catering to that. Next is, I think, configuration and customization and extension. These are the sessions which are going to be taken on the last day. So brace yourself. I will be talking to the next piece, which is overview of eGov and Digit. I do see a question here. I'll pick up the questions in the next 10 minutes. So starting off, giving you a brief about eGov. eGov is a philanthropic mission. It's a nonprofit which was started by Nandan Nilkani and Srikant Nadamani. Nandan, you would obviously know. Uh, Srikant 
was a technical head of the Aadhaar program and he's one of the guys who orchestrated the entire Aadhaar program in India. So the entire principle of ecosystem enablement and working with the partners really directly comes from the philosophy that has been set by the founders. Hence the importance of working with the founders. And I think this is the way we envision us solving complex problems. So we cannot tackle a complex problem in India solely through a silo. Hence, we work with partners to ensure that the entire ecosystem can sort of work towards solving the problem together. So one of the first problems that we are looking at solving is the piece of urban governance. And the specific mission objective of reaching 2000 ULBs is something we've already achieved. And now we're looking at expanding this across the 4,400 ULBs in India. Uh, so we have already done implementations with 14 odd states, and now we're looking at a national rollout. And we have 30 plus partners who look after implementation policy and capacity building. Going into the specifics, uh, Digit is our open source platform, which works on urban governance. And this gives you a snapshot of the states in India who have already implemented Digit or are under implementation. So as you can see, most of the ULBs already have either picked on one or the other specific modules of Digit. And a lot of other states also have the full stack Digit implementation. I will give you an overview of Digit during this session, but this is the current snapshot. And by 2024, the Ministry of Herb Housing and Urban Affairs is looking at uh, rolling this out across all of the states or all of the countries in India. So the process for the same is currently underway. So we can look at more statewide implementations coming your way. And we currently don't do any implementations ourselves. It's only through partners. Hence, it also presents a great opportunity for all the partners to participate in, where they can directly look at a statewide RFP of implementing Digit. Hence, it's a great opportunity in general for all the partners. Uh, I also wanted to give you a snapshot of we don't only work with technology partners. So these are the different partners that we work with in the ecosystem. One is the implementation partners, and I think most of you would fall in that bucket who would be looking at picking up the open source ecosystem and then implementing it in a state or in a specific ULB. At the same time, we also have technology partners through which we develop integrations inside the platform itself. So WhatsApp is a great example of it. So a lot of citizen queries in Punjab are directly catered by the WhatsApp platform. Hence, there are a lot of technology partnerships that we directly do with our technology partners and a lot of innovation from a product point of view comes directly from these partners. We also look at the development partner ecosystem. So a lot of the work around financing, funding, and also last mile implementation, because at the end of the day, we don't just want to make the ULB efficient or effective in terms of their revenues. We also want to improve citizen outcomes. So that is the core of how we function as a nonprofit. At the end of the day, we want to cater to the needs of the citizen. So a lot of development partners, we work on last mile projects, and these are research products where we can look at adoption of the product and also end uh, result of what happens with the citizen. So this should give you a better snapshot of the kind of work that eGov does. And as I said, the core of eGov is ecosystem enablement. And that's what we are here for. Hence, we invest in our partners. And you can see the eGov roles in the implementation partners side. It talks about enablement and support. And this training is part of the same enablement and support that we provide. And in terms of the market opportunity, I've already talked about taking digit pan uh, India. And as part of that, you're going to be seeing a lot of statewide RFPs coming in. Hence, it becomes an exciting opportunity for large partners like you to learn about digit and participate in this market opportunity. While I talked about the urban governance piece, we are also uh, building solutions for other domains. So urban is one where we already have a mature platform, a mature offering in the market. Sanitation and PFM are the two other pieces that we picked on. So this year's partners who already worked with us will also see open source stacks coming out for sanitation and PFM in India. And these again are applicable to partners who are working outside of India as well. So more on this, you will get to hear from when we do release webinars, which happen on a quarterly basis. Then you'll know what are the different products that were already deployed.
now that you've gotten an overview of what eGov's mission is, how do we operate with the market, and what are the different uh, domains that we want to operate in or are already operating in, I want to give an overview of the digit, which is our urban governance stack. So I'll just directly go to this. So digit essentially comprises of digit as a platform for urban governance comprises of three main core elements, which is the core data infrastructure layer, the core services layer and the solutions which are built on top of these solutions. If you want to draw a parallel of this to let's say Android, you can see that registries are generally part of the infra layer. The core services are the services that are used by the applications to perform certain functionalities. And then there's the solution layer. And the way we've architected it is based on the microservices driven architecture. So you will see uh, different repos for, let's say, the core services, the business services, and also the actual solutions as well with the front end as well. Hence, you see the segregation of core data infrastructure, core services, and domain services. So all of these are built in the microservices architecture. And you can see a lot of our design principles are based on ensuring that the platform itself is scalable and extendable. So majority of the works that our partners do, we have five or six applications which we offer as part of the platform, which look at around 70% of the ULB revenue and citizen engagement as the two key objectives. Other applications are directly built by the partners on top of the existing platform hence making the platform more scalable. This gives you a snapshot of what applications or these are the full stack applications which are already available as part of Digit. Uh, so DSS, finance, property tax, building plan approval, public grievance, sewerage, water, trade license, and NOCs are something that we already offer with the front end core services and the business services as part of the open source stack. And then partners generally as part of an RFP would be adding additional scope on top of these applications. So that's the overall digit and eGov overview. If you have any questions, I can pick them up right now. And then I think I can talk to Om. I'll give it off to Omkar to answer anything else. I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I'll start sharing and I think we'll go to the other section. So Umkar, you want to pick off for program governance? I'll stop sharing my screen. You can start sharing it. Sure, sure. Uh, let's give the group 10 seconds for any questions. Uh, otherwise, I'll start the next session. Perfect. I think there are no specific questions. If you have any queries otherwise as well, I think most of you would already have my email ID or be aware of it. So you can directly ask me. I'll just stop sharing my screen. Okay. I have, I think there are two questions. Does it support auto DCR? Uh, so I'll pick it off. So we have our own, uh, scrutiny engine that we've in, inbuilt as part of the OBPS system. So OBPS is a mix of the scrutiny engine and the process workflows. And partners, ideally when they deploy OBPS, use both the elements together. At the same time, we've had cases where partners have picked up just the scrutiny engine, which is the EDCR part. So it being an extendable platform and an API driven platform, you can always integrate an existing solution with the eGov OPPS solution. So it will support the integration with AutoBCR. How much difference do you see in the platforms in various state governments? Omkar, do you want to answer this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, the way I understand that question is, I mean, compared to other uh, government, other platforms used in government, what is the main difference which it has, right? I think it's between different state governments. What sort of difference do you see in terms of implementation? I think that's mm -hmm. the question. Uh, Panaga, do you think if it's anything different? You can talk about both, I think. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so for, first I'll take the, the earlier one. So, see, digit uh, uh, is uh, a very different way of looking at things, okay? The way digit has been architected and the way uh, it's uh, deployed. So a uh, lot of uh, current platforms in use in the government are monolithic, meaning it's uh, one uh, uh, horizontal platform which has a lot of applications built in, okay? And then uh, if you want to, let's say, scale up one specific module or uh, two specific modules, you have to kind of scale up the entire platform or to cater to, let's say, uh, additional load during your property tax windows or uh, additional load during, let's say, uh, events like Comb, where you see a lot of grievances coming in, et cetera. Okay. But in case of Digit, the, the, we've tried to uh, cater to uh, the services and modules through microservices. Okay. So what happens typically is you will be able to scale each service independently. Okay. That's, that's the beauty of the platform. So let's say you have Digit deployed in a state uh, 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 rollout. And then you see that uh, there's, there's, let's say, uh, we just had the financial year end. And you see that at, at my financial year end, uh, I have a lot of citizens who come up and make payments. Okay. So I want to increase the increase or scale up services for uh, uh, billing and collection, for property tax, for uh, uh, NOCs, which are to be issued at end of each year, etc. So what I can do is I can scale up just those specific services for a specific time. And then once my payment window uh, is over, I can then scale them back uh, to my earlier uh, uh, config, whatever was there. So uh, that's the beauty of uh, the microservice architecture. Okay. And then uh, the other advantages are obviously uh, because it is open source, there is no vendor lock-in. There is no, there are no licenses. There is, I mean, you, the source code is available on GitHub. You can always fork and consume the source code. And plus there's a, there's a solid uh, organization which is backing this and keeps on uh, uh, publishing new updates and upgrades quarter on quarter. So uh, that's the uh, benefit which I'll say Digit has over other platforms, uh, which uh, government has, uh, other state governments have deployed. Uh, as far as implementations go, uh, I think each uh, state implementation is different uh, than the other. And now we will, I'll, I'll take that question as part of my session. Perfect. I think the next one is, is BPA transformed into microservices winner? So as we said, uh, the BPA or building plan approval or the online building plan system, as we call it, which is the answer to the next question as well. Uh, it is transformed into a microservices architecture. So uh, EDCR piece sits separately. At the same time, we also have microservices which do the other process enablement piece for BPA. Do you want to add anything on top of it, Omkar, in terms of uh, extension? We can also mention that. Uh, sorry, Ajay, I missed that. Uh, yeah, that, question. That, that's it, Ajay. You have covered. Sure. Uh, whether spatial data is integrated with building rules and property tax. So spatial data is currently not there as part of the platform. At the same time, we've had partners who have integrated GIS on top of property tax and fecal and sludge management solutions, which use this. So that functionality is there as part of digit purely being an api driven infrastructure and partners have done the gis integration as part of it and a lot of the rfps that you see which are statewide will have a gis component to it as well and partners have taken digit to these uh, states or locations so it is pretty easy to do from that point uh, how do you plug back specific features developed in one state to reusable in another state so, so one is Sure, Unka. Yeah, I can take that question. Yeah, Elzan, Elzan, you're good. Yeah. yeah so uh, this is a uh, this is the beauty of uh, working in an open source culture. So if any new feature is developed by uh, any of our partners for a specific state, they can contribute it back, and then uh, Eager will add it as part of their digit product suite and as part of the upcoming versions. This feature will also be part of digit so that the next state can take it. It will be readily available. Yeah. I think the next one is where is the JIT and the source code available? 
Uh, so I think I will ping you the JIT repository and the chat window after we've gone through the sessions. So you can take a look at that. What else? Uh, any custom plugins developed by partners will be contributed and added to the framework. So uh, we use an MIT open source license for our product and our product contributions are majorly supported by us. At the same time, partners also contribute back post they have done their implementation. So it's up to the partner to contribute as they see fit. At the same time, we've had multiple partners who have contributed multiple modules back. So any custom plugins or add-ons in terms of new modules are contributed back by the platform. But again, it's their call. We don't enforce this as part of uh, the ecosystem that we have created. What is JS layer in terms of accuracy scale Digit can support? Uh, do you want to pick this up, Elzan? I mean, accuracy in what sense? I'm just trying to figure this because we've had JS implementations where uh, PT module has been integrated with GIS. Uh, so yeah. accuracy would be in terms of street up. level. Yeah, Ajay. I don't think we have uh, scaled up uh, to an extent here. We are in the initial stages. So scale of data that we've supported. I think we've done it, not we, partners have done it for multiple VLDs where they've done the on-ground work of uh, collecting data and also then integrating it in the system. So, uh, so all of that is something that we've seen. If that answers your question in terms of accuracy. Perfect, I think we're good. So what I'm gonna do is in the chat window, I'm gonna put the training plan, which you would have seen to register this so that you have access to all the other trainings which are gonna happen. At the same time, I'll also put the uh, Git repo link as well for your reference. I'll give it off to Omkar and we'll talk about the overview of an implementation. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ajay. Uh, share my screen. Yeah, is my screen visible, Ajay? It's coming up, yeah, it's good. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, actually. Uh, this is Omkar. Uh, I uh, look after uh, some of our state accounts and uh, uh, their delivery. Uh, so today I'm here to talk to you about uh, program governance. Okay, so, uh, uh, okay, so before I get into the topic, I would just like to give a brief uh, background of why we are covering this topic. Okay, so uh, we've been working with various levels of governments, individual cities, state governments, national governments since last couple of years. And uh, in, I mean, through our experience, what we have uh, understood is uh, implementation in uh, this public sector or in uh, with, with help, help of the government, it's not... Uh, 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 it's the same as the one you do in corporate. Okay, so then obviously there are certain uh, dynamic uh, uh, attributes uh, which come as part of the domain. Okay, uh, there are so uh, dynamic attributes in the terms of uh, resource allocation, in terms of policies or bylaws which can change, in terms of requirements which are a little fluid than the uh, requirements which normally a corporate firm with very well defined business. Uh, 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 functions would give you okay so uh, there is there is uh, uh, i mean a uh, lot of times there is some uh, uh, unsurety about how to proceed okay so uh, in order to address this uh, what we have done in our programs and uh, we advise various governments to also uh, do is to set up a governance structure Okay, so uh, the governance structure uh, is a structure which is normally uh, kind of formulated when a program is being designed and launched. Okay, so in, in government programs, apart from the technology, uh, not, not just in government, in any large scale programs, apart from technology, the processes play an equally important role. Okay, so uh, because it's not just about deploying technology, it is also about people using that technology to avail uh, benefits and to kind of uh, improve upon whatever they have set out to improve. Yeah. So uh, what we normally propose is this. So this is this is a standard governance structure which uh, we have kind of uh, uh, set up in 
a lot of our programs and is also something which we normally uh, recommend to any of our government accounts and uh, clients who uh, uh, whom we work with okay so this is a this is a, a three level governance structure okay so uh, the topmost structure of this uh, uh, governance comprises of a steering committee okay so steering committee as the name suggests it's it's a it's it's an apex body which comprises of uh, let's say a very senior bureaucrat or even a minister who is kind of championing or driving this program in their respective states or jurisdictions and apart from this person it will be uh, comprising of other decision makers and policy makers who will uh, be responsible for the overall direction this the program takes okay uh, so that's the composition of a steering committee uh, just uh, reporting into this is uh, something known as a program management unit the program management unit uh, in in our urban sense is normally set up at uh, directorate level whereas the steering committee is set up uh, at the secretary level uh, the program management unit is set up at the director level and then this comprises of the uh, uh, execution team uh, which government forms and then uh, resources from this team as well as any other resources as well as implementation partner uh, as a representation there. and then reporting into this program management unit is obviously the implementation partner which which can be one of your firms or any other firm or even let's say government uh, can get their own people to uh, do this implementation yeah and then apart from these three main bodies there are two floating committees which are formed uh, and which are ideally need based okay so there is a technology advisory committee and there is a domain advisory committee so as as the name suggests technology advisory committee looks at a long term roadmap or architecture of the program deployment because uh, like like uh, ajay earlier uh, said so digit uh, is not just a, a suite of limited products right it's a platform with uh, apis and uh, i mean great extension capabilities so the government can very well decide to use the same digit uh, platform implementation for any of their other programs as well and we we've, we've seen government doing that right so uh, this this is where the technology advisory committee comes into play where this committee will review any technology announcements or any uh, external integrations which are required to be done on digit over and above the current program scope there is one and then this will also advise the uh, steering committee as well as uh, pmu program management units on best technology best practices and how do you do releases how do you kind of plan releases with uh, whatever is happening in the field and stuff like that okay and the domain advisory committee uh, like the name suggests will be comprised of domain experts so domain experts in this uh, uh, sense means uh, people who have spent their lifetimes working in uh, working on field in areas like taxation in areas like formulating policies in areas like uh, addressing grievances and stuff like that and then this committee helps the uh, steering committee and program management you know finalize the business requirements okay so the business requirements here can be uh, uh, derived from various policies or can be derived from various on ground requirements which the government have uh, to uh, uh, for which they are going to implement digit okay so i'll i'll move on to the next slide so uh, like like i briefed uh, earlier so uh, this is the composition the subjects which each committee deals with and the frequency of uh, uh, this committee to kind of uh, uh, convene or meet yep so like i said the steering committee will comprise of the program sponsor uh, the director so uh, we've, we've created this from a urban development department uh, scenario but the same structure can be used for any other uh, departments where your organizations might be interested in uh, uh, doing these kind of large programs yep so uh, the steering committee will comprise of program sponsors it will comprise of uh, the program leads or partners from implementation organization and then uh, uh, normally when we work very closely with the state egov also has a participation in the steering committee and this will also have some representatives which the program sponsor deems fit that these people can add value to the overall uh, roll out implementation uh, of the program and then the subjects which the committee deals with uh, include uh, setting the program vision mission statements uh, allocation of resources any policy or process reforms which are required to implement the uh, program uh, oversight and then obviously conflict resolution if there are uh, certain areas and uh, 
conflicts arise because of them this is the committee which will oversee and then uh, set the direction of what exactly needs to be done yeah the the next program management unit like i said is the uh, execution unit okay uh, this will look after execution of the program this will look after change management which is required as part of any successful uh, technology deployment program this will do the monitoring and evaluation uh, troubleshooting and escalation and procurement Uh, so any rfps or any any uh, uis which need to be floated will are normally uh, passed through the pmu uh, and then this uh, because it's an it's a execution committee this meets uh, sooner weekly or fortnightly as uh, needed uh, for the uh, success of the program and this is comprised of uh, the uh, director of urban development or uh, a senior is officer uh, and then the program managers from state and implementation partners Uh, procurement specialists and then also representatives from the urban local bodies who are uh, se senior representatives from urban local bodies who are part of the role yep uh, the next is uh, 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 these two committees which i uh, briefed earlier on so technology advisory committee and domain advisory committee so uh, like i said the tac and dac as we call them in uh, practice so tac will uh, look after uh, infrastructure integration architectural realignment and release planning etc and then uh, uh, the dac will look after policy reforms uh, process standardization business requirements etc so uh, yeah uh, these these are the these are the uh, uh, advisory committees as we uh, uh, as we have uh, proposed in our previous implementation so uh, ajay you want to uh, put up the poll uh, it created for us sure oh, and then that. then we can move on to the q and a i think i've just launched it So, just want to get your point of view in terms of the governance mechanisms that you have seen. Have you followed a same approach for technical advisory committee and domain advisory committee, and how that's been different from the larger program implementations that you've seen before? I will give it another five seconds and then close and then we can go on to Q and A. Also, a uh, uh, couple of points uh, I want to add in addition to uh, what we just discussed. So, uh, the implementations in government, like I said, they are uh, different primarily because of uh, two three reasons. Okay. So, first one is uh, because it's because the the function of government deals with. Uh, Uh, sensitive uh, subjects and service delivery to citizens so there is there is no uh, rejection of service as such right so normally what happens is uh, in in case of a corporate firm uh, just just drawing very very loose parallels so let's say a, a corporate is offering a specific service and uh, they have a specific uh, kind of business uh, line right and then if if uh, uh, someone goes to that firm and asks for something which is completely not part of their uh, routine business they can very well say that okay we don't do this but that's not the case when the governments are concerned okay normally when citizens go to the government they expect that we all expect that we should be served and the service should be delivered right so that's that's one major challenge in uh, kind of freezing on very concrete business requirements so that is that is one major reason second is the resources in this domain are obviously i mean while the resources are there they they are uh, they might be diverted to some emergency like the covid emergency right now or to something else right so what happens is uh, if the the uh, program starts with specific objectives and if uh, we've budgeted for let's say a 50 member team on the government side and then if let's say 10 members are diverted to something very important which has come up a natural emergency or anything like that 
then there has to be some specific realignment in terms of your uh, uh, release plan your implementation plan and then whatever was required to be completed in the in let's say 9 months will now take let's say 12 months or 15 months so uh, these are the kind of scenarios or uh, you know, situations which we have normally seen and then the structure is something which helps everyone right government uh, the implementation partners and various uh, uh, related stakeholders to uh, very systematically uh, discuss and deliberate upon these sort of exceptions which are required to be taken and then uh, kind of move ahead in a, a, a concrete manner So we've gotten the results of the poll. I'll just share the results. I think it's a seventy-five twenty-five split on most programs being similar to what is being presented. So, Umkar, do you want to emphasize on the role eGov plays, and how do you see potentially this could be different? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so like I said, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, we have been working with uh, various governments uh, in various capacities in the in, since the time we were founded okay so early on our role involved mostly around doing implementations ourselves and then working very closely with the government but like like ajay uh, brief very early on uh, the the uh, fact of the matter is because we are uh, out to achieve a mission and then that mission requires a certain scale and speed we uh, started working with uh, uh, partners various ecosystem partners like yourselves uh, in order to kind of achieve that uh, scale and speed yeah. so uh, now uh, in any of our uh, programs going forward the role which ega will play is normally we uh, work with partners to help them uh, put up this governance structure for various programs and then uh, depending on how our engagement is with the state Uh, uh we will decide either to be part of the governance structure or we'll just support partners uh, behind the scenes so we have done both uh, in, in various opportunities uh, from a case to case basis so uh, there are there are a lot of opportunities nowadays which partners independently build and they reach out to us so there will normally work with partners to help them succeed in these programs and then there are also various opportunities where we are working with various government bodies and then there will play a more concrete role in the uh program governance scheme of things and i think another point here is purely because of being non profit the value of trust that comes into picture with the government so government knows when we are on the table with them we are actually talking in their interest because our interests are not really commercially aligned so that gives us actually a lot of leverage while talking to state governments which has helped a lot of partners in previous implementations as well so to have difficult conversations with state governments as part of the steering committees purely by being a non profit we are able to have that leverage on the table which again plays out really well because it helps solve problem for implementation partners really early on rather than waiting for partner problems to come up so that again is a key element which uh, we've seen in general in partner led implementations where egov's involvement with state government also gives them a lot of leeway to have those difficult conversations which again is difficult to have with state governments because you're talking to senior bureaucrats and you'd want to put up put up a good face so that's again a point which i think where egov has been able to help partners specifically with respect to governments uh we can take questions now or uh, any specific questions around governance structures problems that you possibly have faced as part of implementing a large state state transformations that we can possibly address today i'll just give this uh, 10 seconds meanwhile omka do you have anything else that you'd want to add that's all from us we'll take any questions in think i see a hand up let me give me one second I'm just figure who that was i think it's akhil one second akhil so akhil you can unmute yourself and ask the question ajay this is jake here 
um is sakil on the in the queue is he waiting to respond uh so he had put his hand up for something specific i don't know why so i thought he had a question okay then can i go ahead yeah sure please yeah so that's a nice presentation that we had today and um, we do have certain questions uh, regarding the implementation in the state um if you can just take us through the process how it was implemented um that would be very helpful how did you train the people what were the kind of training programs that you conducted for your partner how did you enable him because i understand the governance part of it and uh, that is fairly well covered but what is it that we look forward or that we can look forward from you uh, from enabling us sure i think omkar or elzan would be the perfect people to talk about this so either one of you want to pick this up i mean even i can give a brief of kind of enablement we do but i'll give it off to omkar or elzan omkar you may go sure sure okay so uh, the way we have like like i said earlier the way we have worked with partners uh, uh, previously and then we also hope to work with partners is right from the program inception stage okay so now it depends on uh, how it goes right so uh, that I'll, i'll i'll cover both the tracks so in in some cases uh, we are uh, working uh, on advising a government body and then they decide to float an rfp and then various firms or even our partners they decide to bid for that rfp okay and then the there is normal rfp procurement process evaluation etc and then the state onboards a specific entity okay they might or might not be our partner we don't normally uh, differentiate so that's that's one route the second route is where partners are actively chasing an opportunity Uh, some government body and then they kind of bid the rfp they win that rfp and then they kind of uh, uh, see value in using digit or even in partnering with ega as part of implementing that specific program and then they are kind of you know, approach us and then we we kind of sign up so uh, these are the two i mean the the difference actually ends there so these are just two uh, possibilities which we have seen there might be some new ones as well but these are the two normal possibilities which we have seen uh, till now uh once this happens what we normally do is we uh, uh do uh, we we kind of share the prerequisites which are required to implement digit uh, i mean this this session is uh, a high level overview of the prerequisites and they are also published on our uh, uh, partner enablement page so uh, the same prerequisites is something which we'll share with our partners and we'll work with them to see uh, whether they have the sufficient uh, skill set or they have the sufficient uh, let's say infra uh, which is required to deploy digit and then customize and configure that that is one once that that preparedness check is done we will kind of uh, do a full stack training for the partners this full stack training normally revolves around uh, uh, a week to two weeks uh, this is this is designed on a need to need basis because Uh, each implementation or each program will have their different requirements so if there are uh, more number of modules which are required to be uh, implemented uh, the training will obviously be longer but if it's a very uh, specific uh, implementation for a specific scenario we will we'll kind of work with the partner to kind of design a solution or a deployment around deployment strategy around that specific case yeah so then then i mean th- that that kind of comprises of the full stack training where we'll work with you to uh, enable your teams on uh, how do you kind of deploy digit on let's say state data centers or on uh, even commercial clouds oh, like oh. aws or hello yes yeah i'm sorry we can hear you yes we can Ajay, mute akhil uh, i think there's some uh, noise coming in from his one second yeah so we will we'll work work uh, with your teams and enable them to deploy digit on uh, uh, the chosen infra will also kind of work with the teams to enable them on how do you customize digit how do you kind of uh, customize the front end back end business rules etc for your specific requirements and then once the uh, enablement is done we normally uh, uh, have some uh, support slas and kind of support mechanism using slack and jira normal tools which are used in the tech world to uh, do uh, 
day to day or operational kind of a support uh, and then we'll also kind of help uh, in case uh, our advice is required in coming up with any uh, solutions or any specific solutioning which needs to be done on top of digit if you're planning to build anything new so we'll also uh, kind of uh, work with your teams to kind of proofread the architecture the design apis etc and then also Uh, advice on certain best practices which we have seen work from our previous implementations so that's that's how our normal enablement cycles go so i'll add another layer on top of it i think yeah. uh most of the enablements where we get actively involved with and i think i've had this conversation with multiple folks here is when there is a state wide rfp which is in play so generally in the two gtm methods that omkar Talked about which is partner led and state led where we get engaged. There's another element where partners have directly taken digit to state without our involvement, and which is what happens in let's say individual URBs. So for smaller implementations which are not state wide, it's generally the partners who build the capacity internally to train themselves and then directly take digit to the market. And to do that, the kind of enablement we provide is majorly i think similar to what you've seen in the chat window so we've given the chat repo out these trainings are open trainings for whoever is interested uh, in terms of taking digit to the market and documentation which you see as part of the digit platform is very extensive so documentation covers all the modules and the workflows and the demos for all the products and the functionalities as well so we've had partners who have built competency on digit by their own purely through documentation and uh, deploying the digit uh, toolkit directly and then take it to market directly without us being involved at all so we got to know purely from the state hey someone is already doing something or building on top of something on digit so that's again another element which comes into play if it's not a state wide implementation so we being a non profit uh, generally uh, actively support implementations which are only state wide and that's a decision we took some time back purely because of the capacity that we have and adding on to the similar question which panaga asked which was regarding folks who want to take the jet outside of india so as i said panaga the sorry if i'm pronouncing the name wrong uh for implementations which are not india not state wide it's the partners themselves who do generally develop the capability internally and partners have done that and taken digit out uh, to let's say specific individual ulbs at the same time when we see that you have the capacity to build on digit your technical team is trained by the trainings that you're seeing right now post that you can take a call in terms of are there any partners that you would want to align in so we generally want our partners to also train or have capacity on digit post which we can ask some of the partners who have already done some work on digit if they'll be interested in an opportunity like this so it's an ask we can make again we don't get directly involved because we are a non profit and we are not biased in terms of the kind of partners that we do favor so happy to do that at the same time you need to build technical capacity internally this is what our other partners have done as well or uh, whether a demo development space is available so you're asking for a sandbox environment so we don't have a sandbox environment yet and most of the partners would do demo development procure their own instance and they use the instance internally at the same time we can give a demo uh, environment i think that is something which we are using internally but we will have a demo environment possibly in next couple of quarters which will help partners look at uh, how what are the different products which are out there so we can we will possibly have this in place in next two quarters where can we find the list of implementation partners i think uh, the deck that i walked you through it had a list of the implementation and the technology partners so post this i can directly share the deck with you which will give you a good reference of the kind of partners that you are working with and then you can directly reach out to them as you see fit any other questions that you would want me to take uh, there is one concern um, which um, the clients have is uh, regarding the data security uh, is there any uh, at any point in time that we are dependent on cloud services hosted by digit 
So we, the deployment which is done on Digit is independent of the kind of environment that you're going to be using. So we've had people who have deployed it on state data centers, people who have deployed it on commercial clouds ranging from Azure to uh, AWS as well. So there's no dependency created for that. At the same time, from a security point of view, uh, we will also release out a security audit, possibly in next release, which will also give you an idea of the security of the platform per se as well. So that's something we do as part of the release notes. So any um, other questions? I yes, would ask you to it? put the questions in the Q&A box if you can, purely for the sake of all the other participants as well. Uh, we're not able to uh, put the questions in the chat box. The chat is disabled, right? Q and A box. You should be able oh, to put it in the Q and A box. Yep. Yeah. Just one last question regarding security, because when we go to the state data center, there is a criteria that we should be cert certified, as the Kerala cert has to certify the uh, application before we host any application on the state data center. So, do you have a certification from the cert, or do we have so, to initiate? So, in terms of the certifications specifically related to security. Any partners who's implementing Digit directly does the security testing on their end, purely because there's an open source system and you have access to the code base directly. Any kind of security certification, which again is going to be specific to uh, you using either SDC or commercial cloud, is directly done by the partners, which is what we've done in past implementations as well. Okay, thank so you. Any certifications partners are directly responsible for it and they get it done for the specific module that they are implementing. Perfect. Uh, I think we'll just move on to the next piece. If there are any more questions, we can take them up or we can take them up as Alzan take you, takes you through the next session. Alzan, you want to share your screen? Yes. Thanks, Ajay. Uh, Ajay, I guess there is a poll to start with. Sure, I'll just launch that in one second. Perfect. I think I've launched the poll. Uh, I guess the second question is something that we have to ask first, and the other one is after the training. But whichever. We are done. So we'll give this 20 more seconds. I'm closing the poll. Uh, do you want me to share the results as well? Yeah. Okay. So it looks like most of them have basic knowledge of microservice architecture, which is good. Yeah. Good. We can start. 
Yeah. Hello, everyone. So uh, this is Elson here. I would like to cover what are the uh, prerequisites from a skill set perspective, both for the development team, uh, hardcore uh, back end and front end engineers, as well as the uh, DevOps team. So uh, as as part of the introduction, we have already covered it's a microservice architecture. So uh, we are using, uh, we are encouraging cloud based uh, deployment also. So keeping all of that in mind, uh, we are going with open API contracts. So most of our APIs are uh, open uh, API standards and uh, we'll be sharing the REST APIs for integration with third party solutions or uh, you already have a system uh, running in the state and you want to introduce digit and then integrate those system onto digit. So all of that integration happens through APIs. So Swagger is the tool which we are using to define the APIs and all the API contracts will be available in our uh, Git repo and our uh, documentation link uh, with Swagger links. So JSON, Swagger, so these two go hand in hand. So JSON is something we extensively use in our entire digit. Uh, if you see our configuration, master data, most of that is defined in a JSON pattern. Then coming to Postman, so this is the tool which we use for uh, API uh, testing or integration or whatever. So if, if you just want one API from digit, that's also fine. You can use, you can test it using the Postman. So uh, that's on the post, uh, Postman. Coming to Postgres, uh, digit is right now implemented on Postgres, though there is no hard wiring, you can uh, put whichever database you want, but currently, out of the box solution, we have designed it on Postgres. Coming to Java and REST API. So Java is the basic thing that uh, we are using and REST APIs, which I've already covered. So basics of Elasticsearch, why we are using is for uh, reporting and dashboarding. So all the transaction data, we are uh, pumping into an Elasticsearch server. And then from there, what sort of uh, reporting you want to do, you can do. So uh, just the basics of Elasticsearch we are using, but again, uh, implementation team and partners can take it more extensively. Uh, Maven is something we use for build. Yeah, so Spring Boot is an application. So each uh, services is going to be a Spring Boot application. So basic knowledge of that is required. Uh, Kafka is the uh, queue that we are using. So most of the transactions we have kept asynchronous. So all the communication happens through Kafka. So uh, if there is a series of activity happening, so it is being routed through the Kafka queue. Yeah, Zool is the API gateway. So it's very important to have good understanding of Zool. Uh, coming to front end, we have some modules on React.js and there is one module done on Node.js. So there is no front end restriction. That's the reason we have built a uh, front end on different um, architecture. So if people are familiar with React, they can build, uh, if you're building a new module, I'm saying, you can do it on React or you can do it on any front end. Uh, as long as uh, the JSON communication, REST API communications are there, uh, backend will support. Uh, we have a portal which is done on WordPress and PHP. So this is used only for the web portal. So these are the skill sets that uh, we have for the dev team, basically the engineering team, both front-end developers and back-end developers. Yeah, so coming to the DevOps team, uh, it's more extensive. Uh, as you know, it's a microservice architecture and uh, it supports multiple clouds. So cloud understanding is very important. Deploying on cloud and the, uh, so be it any, any one at least, they have to be familiar with either AWS, Azure. So we have deployed on NIC cloud also. So at least Azure or AWS, they should be familiar with. Of course, strong knowledge of Linux and Kubernetes cluster, uh, how to create a Kubernetes cluster and uh, or all the Kubernetes uh, cube spray and all of those uh, basic uh, things they should be aware of. 
then terraform is something we are using for provisioning so out of the box we have few uh, terraform scripts available if they want to customize on that they can do that so basic understanding of terraform is important then load balancer, firewall, routing, DNS. These are the basic skill set required by any uh, DevOps engineer for that matter. Then for build pipeline, uh, we use Jenkins, uh, but any gen any uh, build pipeline tool should be good enough. At least they should have experience in at least one uh, CI/CD tool. Uh, then Golang, Python, they are all scripting tools. It's nice to have. In uh, knowledge on all of that, though it is not a uh, must. We already have Golang scripts uh, for uh, deploying. They can use that. Then uh, Docker, the, uh, Docker understanding on Docker is very important because uh, all of this will be Docker container and uh, Docker images. So those experience is very important. Then coming to the, uh, so Nexus and Docker Hub, so these are the places where we uh, push these uh, artifacts and keep. So they should know how to uh, put the data there, put the images there, retrieve the images there, and uh, archive it and stuff like that. Uh, so I think soon we have covered then SSL certificate, how to create SSL certificate, how to re renew an SSL certificate, stuff like that. Uh, then the basics uh, of Git. Git how to manage Git, basically the Git branching, uh, the PR review process, who can do a pull request and how do you uh, act, control the access right? So the all the authentication part of Git repo and experience in Helm. So Helm is a, uh, so Helm tool we are using for uh, building and deploying again. Uh, so those scripts uh, we have as part of the package but of course, you will have to enhance on that as and when you are adding more and more uh, modules on top of Digit. So JBoss is something we are using for um, OBPaaS at the EDCR side. Mm, but uh, right now, we have made that also containerized. So it's an optional thing. Uh, Redis, Nginx, Apache. So all of this is important. Postgres, we have already covered there. So coming to the DevOps. Uh, skill set high level we have covered this yeah certain skill sets are mandatory certain are nice to have yeah now i can take questions i think there's one from Sudarshan, and he's asking is elastic search implementation available or in pipeline one second, I'm not able to see the one second. Is Elasticsearch available? Or is, yes, it is available. Elasticsearch, but that's what I said. Whenever we write to the database, uh, the Kafka queue will write the same set of data to Elasticsearch server as well. But whether you want to consume it in some manner for reporting and dashboarding, that is purely up to you. But platform pushes the data to Elasticsearch server if it is configured. Any more questions? There's, there's nothing else which is open. Just wait for 10 seconds and then yeah. move to the infra prerequisites. So basic understanding of Microsoft microservice architecture is important for both the engineers as well as uh, the backend front end developers as well as the DevOps engineer because uh, debugging is slightly different from our ERP world. So. So Wildfly, we were using in, I'm, I'm taking this question, which component we use for Wildfly. Uh, so Wildfly server, we were using for EDCR, but as part of the latest release, we have made that also as a Docker container. So we can ignore that. Do we have, do we have OB reporting based on Elasticsearch or we have API available for the same? Okay, so right now, uh, see, you, from Elasticsearch server, using uh, APIs, you can, of course, retrieve data. But we have basic dashboards built with the KPIs that uh, our existing states have asked for. So we that comes out of the box. Um, 
have I answered your question? Sudarshan? Sudarshan, if you can either raise your hand up or ask another question if it's not answered. What kind of dashboard implemented? Okay. So we what have kind of dashboard implemented, uh, basic dashboards to show the revenue. Okay, please, please speak. Uh, can you raise your hand up, Sudarshan? I will allow you to speak. And you can see an option of raise hand up. Okay, got it. I guess he wants to ask. Yeah, or oh, he can unmute. We can't hear you if you're speaking. Yeah. Hello, is it audible now? Yeah. Yeah, it's audible now. Oh, uh, yeah. I wanted to ask, as we are saying that we are writing the data in the two places. One is database and other in Elasticsearch. So, so the Elasticsearch data that we currently yes, we are writing into it, so like we have all the indexing structure or we have that needs to be decided by the uh, partner, like uh, if you are using by ourselves. Okay. So, what you want to write, you can define it in one configuration file and it gets pushed according to that. So as part of the product, we are pushing some data. Uh, if you feel, okay, that is not enough, you can uh, easily configure it and uh, get that pushed. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Does Digit also support customize or any other package manner similar to him? Uh, I request Shravan to answer this. Shravan is our DevOps lead. Shravan? Yeah, sorry, I'll Yeah, please take it. Yeah, we, we, can, uh, we can use any other package manager. So as a digit in our partner activities, we are using Yelp, but it is open source. You can use uh, any other packet manager also for the reference. There are a few more questions as well. Yeah. Alzana, are you picking these up or you want me to pick them up? A couple of open questions. Yeah, I'll take it one second. Sure. Is there any data migration tool that it provides? So data migration tools, uh, when you say, we have written certain kits uh, for migrating property tax data, for migrating water charges data, but those are all it's i can't say it is a very a generic thing you may need to tune it according to your data so the thing is you can def we can define data in a certain standard and give then this tool will take care so whatever available will be there in the git you can use it this did it provide any code review as part of the services to assist the tech partners or reviews or limited the contribution? So basically, uh, when it comes to contribution, uh, we are asking uh, the teams to give a pull request. And we have our internal panel who reviews the code and then merges it back to the master branch or give a comment and then get that corrected. So that's the mechanism right now we are following. It's all restricted through pull request. There is no direct uh, commit access. Yeah, this is specific only to the contributed code. We don't yeah. review any implementation code which goes out. Hmm. 
next section on infrastructure prerequisites shravan will take ajay sure okay thank you give it to shravan yeah thank you ajay Uh, I guess with Shravan, I'm uh, taking up a DevOps uh, activities for a few accounts, for partner accounts. So I just uh, share my screen. Just give me a moment. Yeah, please confirm if you can see my screen. Yes, sir, sir, Shravan. Yes, thank you. Uh, so as Eljan already discussed, like uh, it's a digitis. Everything is based on microservice structure. So we are we are implementing all the digit services in Kubernetes cluster. So the infra prerequisites, I can say, uh, the first thing is we need to install a Kubernetes cluster. It can be on uh, any commercial clouds like uh, EKS or uh, in Azure or in GCP or in data data centers or in any open platform. So. uh so the we need uh, for the for the high availability of the cluster we need to uh, set up with uh, three masters minimum of three master nodes and four worker nodes so which uh, requires of more like we can use ubuntu or centos or whatever it may be depending on our requirements uh, so it, the minimum should be 4 gb ram and 2 cpu for the masters uh, and 2 gb ram and 2 cpu for master and um, for worker nodes so uh Yeah. So once the cluster is created, then other infra requirements we can um, um, can have the all the ports open uh, like cluster TCP port or whatever six double four three ports, which is using the Kubernetes API server. Uh, and as you see uh, in my screen, you can uh, just we can go through all the port ranges that Kubernetes is using. Um, that's it. And. So and after the cluster creation, we do have different uh, types of environments on the cluster. So uh, if we take for a specific account, we can we need to have some three environments. One is Dev and UAT and production for to take up a uh, to test and deploy whatever the requirements from the digit partners. So in this account, we'll be having three types of cube configs. One is the user um, user roles, different things. So because uh, for the Uh, for testing and other guys, we will be giving our back configuration using just uh, you know read access to the Kubernetes cluster, and for the um, partner leads, we can give the admin access to the Kubernetes cluster. So we need to have the cube configs generated for three types of partners. Uh, so, and the other thing is in Digit, we are using a stateful sets, you know, uh, for like uh, Kafka, Elasticsearch. So we need to have. Uh, um, volumes for that uh, configure to the you know uh, for the stateful sets we can it can be some EBS volumes if we are going for any uh, uh, any AWS uh, platform if it, it can be some ISKS volumes or NFS if we are hosting Kubernetes cluster on state data centers and we need to have uh, public uh, I mean internet gateway or NAT gateway if it is in AWS cluster and we need to Uh, um, we, yeah. Uh, so we need to have the NAT gateway if it is in AWS because uh, the NAT gateway uh, will load the traffic uh, and to the Kubernetes cluster, and we need to set up the firewalls if we are uh, hosted the cluster in uh, you know SDC. And depending on the state data center, they will be routing the firewalls to create some inbound and outbound rules which allows the traffic to the Kubernetes cluster. Um, And coming to the database, um, as Eljan mentioned, we are using the Postgres database, but, but it's up to the technical. I mean, it's up to the delivery partners. So um, we need to have one VM instance or any uh, plain uh, SDC server. Uh, we can use RDS if it is hosted in AWS cluster. So and depending on the I mean, minimum is 16 GB and 100 GB configuration need to be uh, for the database server. and we can increase the database uh, depending on the traffic uh, flow or the or the traffic that is sitting in the cluster and the other thing is uh, for you know, we need to have uh, one uh, ci cd tool like uh, jenkins or openstack whatever it can be so in in, in general in need of a digit uh, product we are using the jenkins uh, 
uh, and the next thing is we need to have an access repo where we are storing the artifacts so it can be an access or any other repo uh, uh, docker is because we for the all the docker uh, microservices we are building the docker images and pushing to the docker uh, registry so uh, it need to be a one docker registry account for each of the partner and one source control tool uh, which we, it's, it's like open source you can just fork all the things and you can have your own git repo and you can fork all the repos in your git repo and dns uh, uh, a more, i mean we we need to have one dns to have the public ip assigned to the kubernetes cluster uh, and different subdomains uh, 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 to be hosted on the dns and we can we need to have one ssl certificate we can say it as like let's encrypt or godaddy or uh, in, and we can use any wildcard certificate and depending on the state requirements. Um, yeah, that's it for my end. So the main thing is we need to, the infra requirement is uh, three masters with the four worker nodes, the Kubernetes cluster and all the ports will be taken care of by while creating the Kubernetes cluster. And one is one source control tool and one uh, CI CD tool, one Nexus uh, repo and for one account for Docker registry. So I can say this is the basic prerequisites for hosting a digit platform. Um, yeah, that's it for mine. Just let me know if you have any questions. And this, the most of the topics, I mean, ego related deployments will be, uh, I think, taken care of by Gajendran maybe in the next slot. So Gajendran will be taking the DevOps session, I think, from 3.30, if I'm not wrong. So for a further detailed discussion on the DevOps piece, you can always join that session today in the afternoon. Uh, any specific questions or queries that we can address for you? Jay, is there any poll here? Uh, no, specifically here, not. I'll just give this 10 more seconds if we have any questions for any of the sessions. So this is the last part of the implementation overview session today. So anything related to my session or cast sessions or Zan session, happy to answer. Perfect. If there's nothing else. Let me just do this. I'm just going to put an email ID. So, sorry, I missed misspelled partner. Yeah, there is a question. So benchmarking uh, from an infrastructure perspective, if you're asking, yes, we will be putting out something. So any other questions which you think have not been answered, you can drop an email to partner at egos.org.in and we can revert back to you on the same email. Any last comments, last views? Or I think we're good. Perfect. I think we are good. There are no further questions. Thank you everyone for joining the session today. At the same time, if you want yourself or your team to join any other session, I think I'd already posted the link for the training sessions. I'll just repost the same. You can check out all the other sessions. One second. Yep, so the last chat link, it talks about all the other sessions which are happening today, tomorrow, and day after, which will look at uh, DevOps engineering training, which will also look at the product demos. So anything specific that you're interested in, you can look at all the sessions here and register yourself. So thank you everyone for joining. Have a great rest of the day and I'll see you again if you're joining any of the other trainings. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you, Jim.